focuses on um, the story, African-American story of migration from the South to the North. And relate, we relate that to the story of the monarch butterfly, which is one of the only butterflies that migrates over 3,000 miles from Muchicon, Mexico to Nova Scotia, Canada and back. And so we do that so we can relate to a species and understand that everything and everyone has a story of migration. We migrate for different reasons, be it be better opportunities, um, safety, food, or love, as we had Jenny tell us last month with her story, or just for the heck of it. So um, without further ado, here I have my auntie Lillian Smith, and she's gonna share us her story of how she grew up in Pace, Mississippi, as a sharecropper's daughter. And I wanna keep in mind that she grew up in a time when we would transition, when they were transitioning from being cotton pickers or sharecroppers to, um, what was it? To modern times or whatever, you know, they were coming out of that era of Jim Crow and, or slavery. And so without further ado, Lillian Smith will tell her story. Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening, oh, it's evening time. Good evening, everybody. Hi. Uh, like she said, my name is Lillian Smith, and I was born in Pace, Mississippi. Uh, and, and Pace, Mississippi was considered a city, okay? One store, one cafe, and my, grand, my aunt, my great aunt on that cafe. So I was born in the back of my Aunt Lucy's cafe on a Friday night. And I used to tell that story as a little kid. And I said they was frying fish because in the South, Friday was a fish night, okay? And I didn't like fish, so I'll tell the story about the fish because I didn't want to eat fish, okay? So anyway, with my mother moved when I was about two from Pace, Mississippi to a town called Beulah, Mississippi. And that's where I live and went to grammar school in Beulah, Mississippi. I had a lot of experience in Beulah, Mississippi. Uh, some of the funny things I was telling Princess that she really loved about me, how I was the youngest of the girls and it was three boys under me. So my first job was babysitting and I was three years old when my brother was born. And my mother taught me how to take care of my little brother. When he was born, he weighed 10 pounds and I was always little. So at 22, five, I didn't weigh but 90 pounds. So you know how small I was at two or three years old. So anyway, I was the babysitter for my brother. I learned how to fix my breakfast from a wood stove warmer. You all probably wouldn't know what that is. Look it up on your phones and find out what a wood stove would warm is. That's where my oatmeal was put in the morning with my biscuit. And I had to get it when I woke up and got dressed. I dressed myself at three years old. So I can go way back with my baby brother. And so I would, no telephones, no communication. I was too small to call my mother. So what she did, she tied the baby diaper to a wood stick and I would wave the wood stick on the front porch and she would come to the house to see about the baby when it was time to see about the baby. When lunchtime come, there was no clocks when I came along, okay? It probably was, but not in our house. There was no clock. So she taught me how to tell time by the sun and what time of day. When the sun got in the middle of the sky, it was 12 o'clock and she was on her way home to see about me and the baby to fix our lunch. And so, as I grew from that age in Beulah, Mississippi, up to the age where I went to school, and when I went to school, they, and those days when the kids went to school, you had to know your name, you had to know how your different colors. You learned that at home. You didn't go to school to get that. So the kids that went to school came home to teach the younger ones how to do that: the alphabets, the numbers, the name. I was telling her the address, everybody knew where the house was, so we didn't have to know certain addresses. Okay. So I learned all of that in Beulah, Mississippi. So when I left Beulah, Mississippi, the times was changing where the cotton picking, oh, by the way, the other job, I was a water girl, not only a babysitter, but I was a water girl. So I had to uh, pump the water. And I was too short. To, I, you may not know what a pump is, but you pick the handle up and you bring it down. And, and so I couldn't do it like this. So I'd have to push it all the way up and then jump up and grab it and let the water come down in the bucket, okay? And of course, that was, to me, was not a fun. I was getting exercise. We didn't have to worry about going to the gyms because we had plenty of exercise because we could work back then and get your exercise. So my little brother, uh, praise the Lord, on January the 11th, 
that little brother that I made it said was the last one of my siblings and he passed on January the 11th. And we were still close relatives because mama taught, my mother taught us how to love one another. You love family or you love anybody else. So that's how I grew up uh, some of my memories. I remember we had the farm that we were on was a large farm and everybody kind of like fed off of our farm. They come there to get the flour, they meal a lot because my daddy was the one that went to town and got everybody's grocery. And we enjoyed sorting it out. That's how we learned how to fill buckets without you give everybody. Uh, the other thing that happened, uh, I never was an animal person. So she was asking me about the chicken. I don't remember taking the chicken head off, and you know, but I remember what all happened to the chicken. I don't like anything but the chicken wing. Won't eat the chicken, okay? Uh, the other thing happened, we had a goat. Oh my God. And so my job was to pick up the chips. Chips is what you put in the stove to keep the stove going and the food warm and the cooking and all of that. So I would have to get up in the morning, get dressed and go get the chips. And every time I would get this bucket half full of chips, I don't know where this goat come from, but he would butt me in the back and knock me in the chips down. So I would run crying to my mother. My mother said, go back, get you a switch and whoop the goat so he won't butt you down. I could never catch the goat, but he was still butt me down. I don't know what the ending of the story was, but I remember he always butt me down. And then I had an experience with a turkey. We, we had turkeys on the farm and I was uh, babysitting my sister's kid and her grandmother, your mother. I was babysitting your mother, but she wasn't born at that. I babysit all of the kids up to her mother's age. Anyway, she, the, 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 the turkey would come to the, my window every morning. He would just make all this noise. And I would say, go away, go away. Because if he would wake up the babies, I would have to get up. So I was trying to keep the so I got up, went outside and got a brick and I hit the turkey. Forgot all about the turkey. So one day I went outside and the turkey jumped on me and took his claws and held me down and whipped me with his wings. He just, he just, <laughs> and I was worried about it. My dad said, what's the matter? I said, the turkey whooped me, the turkey, and the turkey came with, okay, so that's the end of that story, okay? Um, let's talk about what a sharecropper is and um, about the cotton and stuff. Okay, sharecropper. My father was a sharecropper and he would plant all of the corn, the cotton, the gardens with the watermelons, all of the vegetables we had. And our farm was large enough that the other farmers, uh, well, I, I don't know about farmers. I know the other families would come to our farm to get their share of vegetables and cotton, sugar, flour, whatever they needed. Because it mostly was like women without husband or had children. And so my fa our farm would feed them. Don't ask me why I was little, I don't remember all of that. But I do know they would come because we would have to sort it out from sweet potatoes to uh, cows, turkey, chickens, whatever. And the killing of the hogs, I told her, it's a season for all meats. We didn't eat steaks and pork chops. We had it, but you didn't eat it year round. It was a certain time of year you could only kill that cow. Certain time of year that you would just eat the chickens and whatever else the farm was, you had all the, like I told you, go, go church, turkeys and all that. Turkeys was only killed at Christmas time. You didn't kill turkeys all year round. So that was the sharecropping work. You bring all the food to one station and everybody come and get out of that station and we never ran out. That's so funny. And when the end of the year come for the sharecropper, my mother, and father, she was the bookkeeper, my father, he taking care of all the land. And they would go and give everybody a stifling at the end of the year. And it was a funny thing because we never stopped paying. So no matter how much you made, at the end of the year, you still owe the man for shit farming from him. So my mother decided that she didn't want her children to grow up like that. She wanted us to go get a full education. And where we was at, it would, we would never do it. So she decided to leave. And so naturally, if she left my father, he wasn't going to stay there either, right? So she had it all. You know, women, we, we have it all figured out. So she left. And at that time... I was 
probably 11. I was the oldest and it was three boys under me. So when she left, daddy left. And all I know, he went to town to tell the man that he was going to move. And the man said, you owe me some money. You got to stay one more year. And my mother said she wasn't staying. So she left and went to my grandmother's who lived in town. And so my dad left. I remember him leaving in the night, late, late at night, because some people came from Chicago. He left with them, came to Chicago, and he ended up in Benton Harbor, Michigan. So when he went to Benton Harbor, Michigan, that's where my mother's father lived at. And that's how I was the first one to go to Benton Harbor, Michigan. So I went to Benton Harbor to stay with him, and that's where I went and I finished school. My mother, well, let me let me let me just make it plain for you. 14 left Mississippi at night in a car coming to Benton Harbor, Michigan. And nobody died, and they all made it to Benton Harbor, Michigan. My grandfather uh, lived in Benton Harbor, and he had, uh, he was a construction, uh, what do they call him? Not supervisor, they wouldn't call supervisor, but he was a foreman for a construction company. So all the men that came got jobs. And back in those times, you couldn't say, this is my son, if you were black, I want to give him a job. You would have to say that, I want to get this young man a job, but he couldn't call you daddy or granddaddy on the job. So my oldest brother went to work and my dad worked for this construction company. And in the Harbor Michigan, my grandfather then built the first season roll book that was there, the first big bank and all of that. That was, you know, a long time ago. But they didn't know that my brother and my father worked for my grandfather. And so that's how the times was back then. So they got their own homes and had their own. My father, my grandfather had a barbecue house and I learned how to cook pig snoots. Probably don't know what that is. <laughs> I wouldn't need them, but I cooked them. <laughs> oh, on Friday night, they would be lining it up, coming to my grandfather's house for the farmers. The farmers was, um, was Michigan was also a fruit farming vegetable place. You got your apples and pears and blueberries. blueberries, grapes, you name it, all the fruit. And, and people as far as Mexico would come to, and Carlos would come to Benton Harbor, Michigan to do the fruit in different little towns in, in Michigan. So they would come out and get the pig snoots and the pops and the wine and the whatever and go back to their little farms and that's what they did. And my uh, grandfather made enough money to build houses for everybody and then Harvard, Michigan offered that pig snoop. I saw Shannon's face go, <laughs> pig snoop. But anyway, that was where I went to school, picked every berry, every broke asparagus. That is the, I hated asparagus till I got grown because the juice off of asparagus stick to your head and make your head all good. But I did that. Uh, I, it's not pick, you break asparagus, pick blueberries, raspberry, beans, spinach, you name it. I did it all. Tied grape vines, the grapes, you all green and, and red grapes. I have tied those vines to those poles. I just want to and I just want to tell a funny story. When we had went to um Behold's blueberry farm, you know, I had brought my auntie. And so I was like, you Lily, you're not having fun picking blueberries and stuff. And it was so funny because she taught me how to tie the bucket to me to pick the blueberries, but I was so excited. And she looked at me, she was like, I was, I, I was raised doing this type of work. I don't want to do this. <laughs> she said, so I remember what this stuff was like. She was like, it's not fun to me. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, I'm sorry. And, <laughs> and some, of the, some of the best peaches in the world come out of Michigan. And let me tell you, I'm allergic to peaches, but I would break out every summer because I, <laughs> I would eat the peaches, cut them up and eat the peaches. But, uh, you broke my train of thought. We were going to. Oh, I forgot. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Anyway, let's let's go. High let's school. Go. High school. No, we didn't tell the story about my. I told about everybody but my grandmother in Mississippi. Okay, let me back. I don't ever want to leave Granny out. That was the rock of the whole family. Okay, so in Mississippi, my grandmother she could. Oh, my grandmother could make some quilts that I still have some that will blow your mind. People don't know how to make quilts. That was she would set up a quilt pattern. 
uh, probably about September, I guess, when we were ready to go back to school. She would put this quilt up in her living room and everybody had a corner. All the neighbors would come. Whatever day they could get there until that quilt was finished. And everybody had their little corner, their little circle that they would sew on this quilt, okay? And they would put their little initials at the end of it. Um, my grandmama would mark it so she would know who made this little quilt and everybody would get a quilt. Even growing up, all of us got quilts from my grandmother that she would have them ready when my, my kids was grown. I mean, was born. My grandmother gave everybody a quilt, okay? So, but she was like, I call her Annie Oakley. Everybody, even my 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 youngest son is 47. Yeah. 47. And he was telling the story last night about grandma. Everybody know about grandma Effie, okay? Grandmama could shoot a rifle better than Annie Oakley. I call her my Annie Oakley. Hi, Tangie. My Annie Oakley. Grandmama, uh, if you dresses and aprons and I, she made all of my clothes. I could go to school and if I could sketch it, I'd look tell her she'd find a piece of material and make me that outfit. That's how she could sew. And but let me tell you, she her favorite saying was, <laughs> I say what I mean and I mean what I say. If I tell you something, you can take it to the bank and cash it in as pure money. And that's what she meant and that's how she did. So she went through some hard times and we all knew about them, but she would talk to us to sit us around. Little kids uh sit around her. When she talked, you sit around her. And my son was telling the story about she kept this little bag behind the chair. And he was telling me the big peppermint sticks. She would break them peppermint sticks up and put them in that little bag. So she knew which piece to give who out of that little bag. Already. So they just loved grandmother and, and how she, you know, she raised us. So she taught us uh, the things. And I, I was telling my great nieces the other thing. Family is all we got. Has nothing to do with color. It has nothing to do with race. It has to do with who you love in your family. And if they join your family, that's a gift from God. But if he give them to you, that's yours. That's a gift. God give you family. So that's what grandmother taught us. And the one story that my son is a minister, my, both are ministers, but the oldest one is on TV. And he tells this story all the time. When I left Mississippi, and I, and I didn't tell Princess Hippie, my grandmother told me, said, I, she took me in the back of the house and she had this little can in her hand and it always had money in it because she would give us this money to go to, we didn't have stores, we'd go to a place called the Rolling Store, which was a car that would come along and sell us candy. So she took me in the back and she gave me this little money. Yeah, this is funny story. She gave me this little money and it was some little dimes. I don't remember nickel and dimes. So I was leaving and I was the first one to leave to go coming back to Mississippi. And she said, I don't have anything to give you but Jesus. And I want you to take this everywhere you go. And believe it or not, I just made seven million. And I've been in some rough spots, but that Jesus she gave me, I, didn't, I just wasn't supposed to be on here, y'all. But that Jesus brought me to where I am now. That has helped me. She taught me how to help the ones behind me. You reach back and you get them in. This wasn't supposed to be a story, but I'm a, I'm a preacher, so listen. Uh, you reach back and you get them and you bring them along. So that's what I did, and that's what I still do. But that was the grandma that taught me to teach the others and the others to teach the others. And so that's what I'm trying to teach. Princess is good at what she do, because she was taught to do what she do. I don't know what she do for you all, but I'm just talking about what she do for them. So let's get back to me leaving Benton Harbor, Michigan. Okay? When you going to tell the story about grandma shooting? Oh, Lord, I didn't want to tell them, and I thought I wouldn't have to tell it. Okay. My grandmother, she, she lived, uh, her father was an Indian. And he went from Mississippi, Arkansas, Georgia, all around the Mississippi River. He was a horse trainer. And so he would train the horses and sell them to the white farms. And he taught my grandmother how to shoot. Like I said, I call her Annie Oakley because she could really shoot gun, rifle, right, it didn't matter. She could shoot it. And he taught them, her and her brother, how to shoot. And the people would come out at night and shoot in their houses. And some people were shooting and grandma was shooting back. The clan. 
tell them. <laughs> the Klan. Well, at them days, it was the Klan, but we didn't know. So what they did was they would steal your land by coming to intimidate you off of it, the shooting, you know, all that kind of stuff. She tried to be nice, but it was the Klan, right? Okay, yeah. Okay. So if they killed you in the house, guess what? The house belonged to them. And wasn't anybody going to say anything about what they did to you or how they did it to you. But it just so happened, my grandmother shot somebody. And they went and arrested her and took her to jail. And my uncle and my mother had to stay over in Arkansas with the other families. And when the judge came, the judge questioned my grandmother. And I didn't know this. They didn't tell kids this. I, I found this out when I got grown, but I knew she had shot somebody. I didn't know he was white. So they said that when she shot, when the judge questioned her, he asked her, did she shoot Mr. So-and-so? And she said, no, sir. He said, you didn't kill Mr. So-and-so? She said, no, sir. Said, well, Mr. So-and-so, you were shooting and Mr. So-and-so died. She said, I didn't see Mr. So-and-so. And he said, so you shot him and you didn't see him? She said, I didn't see nobody. Somebody was shooting at my house and me and my brother. And my dad said, if they start shooting for me to shoot back, and I can show you the walls in the house where they were shooting at me, but I didn't see nobody that I killed. And so the judge asked, did anybody else in there see her shooting? And could nobody say they saw her shoot whoever the guy was? So the judge said, well, one of you all could have shot him. We don't really know who shot him. So he dismissed the case and my grandmother came home. But after that, it was kind of funny. My uncle would always always say, you better watch it, she'll shoot you. You know, it was a joke going around in, in the family. But she would tell you, if she told you, don't do it, don't do it. And she would shoot you if you did. And talk about how she had a gun always. And yeah, she always wore an apron. And I never knew that till I was grown, why she had that apron on all the time. She wore an apron. She would always tell me, say, baby, you always keep your apron on. Apron can be a good weapon. Apron can keep your clothes clean. And I, I always stayed around my grandmother all the time. So she was always talking to me. So anyway, she I said, oh, I would say, oh, okay. And now right now I got aprons all over the place. I wear aprons all the time. I can't go in the kitchen without my apron. That's what, that doesn't have me now. So anyway, she had the gun, the pistol in the apron pocket and the rifle sitting at the door. So when people come up to the house, she would just crack the door and talk out the door. Oh, she'd stand behind the door and talk to them. She would never go out. Everybody respect her. Uh, I, I, she was a kind of um, Harriet Tubman. I remember seeing people getting in the wagon at night, and they would stop us on the road. And I was a little kid, and Mama would put us in the back of the wagon, and we thought it was food and stuff in the back. She would be taking people from one place to another place so they could connect to other families and get from where they was at because they were going to get killed sooner or later. And we would be, and they would stop us in the night town and, and say, hold up there. And my grandmother would go, yes, sir, Mr. So-and-so. And they would say, uh, where you going? And she said, we just take, I've been taught Southern style. We're going to take the chilling down today, mama. Uh, what, what was that? And mom, she would tell them where she was going. Said, okay, then you, you all go ahead, go ahead. And say, we'll be back in the morning. So you had to tell them when you were coming back because you couldn't travel. And most of them travel at night. That was the only way they didn't see you and didn't know where you were going. And I, and I can witness to some of that. And we would be asleep back there by the time, I guess it'd be daylight or what, we'd get to my mother's house. But it was a funny thing. You know, we kids, we turn around, go back to grandma's house. So wherever they stopped off or whatever they jumped off out of the wagon, we didn't know. The last story is about Mississippi, and then I'm coming back no, to Chicago. About the cow, and that's it, the cow. Oh, that tell that story. Okay, my grandmother had cows. We all had cows, but my grandmother had two cows. And so she told a couple and said, go to the barn. That's where the white man kept all the fertilizer, all the, everything you need. She said there's some oil there, because the, the, the bugs was real bad, the flies and everything. And she said, take the oil and rub the cows down with it so the flies won't bite. So, you know, he couldn't read the right polar man. I feel something to this day. Uh, he, he went and got a five-gallon bucket of oil, something he thought was oil, right? And he brought it home and he mopped the cows down. And uh, grandma was gone. So when she came home, she said, why do that cow look like it's sick? And the cows was about to die and stuff. 
And she said, where's the oil? And I tell you, he put his out of the bucket. It had TNT or something that was poison that you put on the cotton, the poison, the bugs and stuff over the cotton, right? He got the wrong bucket. And my grandmother told him that that cow better be alive when she come back or he better be gone. <laughs> and he was gone. I ain't seen that man since. I don't know where he went. Let's go to Angel. Like, yes. Okay, and one more thing. I just want you to talk about like how bad the cotton was for your hands and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. And how much you all used to pick a day, the men. Okay, everybody. They paid everybody the same thing. So it was $3 a day. You, uh, uh, or 50 cents a hundred. And the more cotton you pick, usually it was a family picking. And you have to pick, I think my husband could tell this better than me about how many pounds it was. But I think it was like 12 or 1,500 pounds or something like that. And they put all this cotton in this big truck and they would take it to town and they would weigh it. It was always on the way. You never had the amount you were supposed to have because they were cheating you the money out. But who's going to say anything about it? You just happen to get whatever you could get back in those days. So my uh, <laughs> the women picking cotton made gloves for their hands because cotton starts out the most beautiful flower in the world is a Okra, stalk plant flower, or cotton plant flower. They have some beautiful flowers on. And those flowers turn into bows, like okra. Okra will cut your hand too. So the women picking the cotton, you gotta pull it out of this bulb. So when you go to grab it, those thorns on there stick in your finger and cut your fingers all up. So some of them had, you know, if you didn't know how to do it, you, you have to reach to get the cotton and snatch it. So that's what my grandma called it. You have to snatch the cotton out the bulb and put it in the sack. And they had these big long sacks at the end, so you had to put a strap over your shoulder, sack on your side, and throw the cat in, pull it off, throw it in the sack, pull it off, throw it in the sack. And that's how uh, your hands would look. Women, no no manicures, but no sense. We had nail polish, I'm sure, because my mother had it, but you know, it wasn't no sense in wearing it because it wasn't gonna help the cuticles and all of that around here. So that was the part about picking the cat. Somebody else you want me to tell about listen. Um, just tell about the horse. Cause you know you had a, a nice childhood, the, the horse that you used to ride. Oh, with the, mane. the horse's name was Annie. And Annie would come up to the porch and all the little kids, she'd lean down for all of us and we'd grab the mane and climb up on her. But I was scared of Annie. I was scared of really horses. Cause I didn't like that jumping up and down still up. So we would get on, she would take us all around the house, bring us back and put us at the porch and let Lo get off and just all the, the farmers, kids came to our house to stay, especially on weekend. The aunts would go to town to party and the kids stay at our house. So the horse would go around and come back and put us off and we'd get out. So one day we was coming from the house for something and my sister was, she was, she was a tomboy. She was riding a horse and uh, she told me to get on. I said, no, I don't want to ride no horse. I don't like horses. She said, get on, I'm not going to make the horse. And she kept thinking, I'll get on the horse. She reached out and pulled me up on the horse. I get on the horse. I get on the horse, she kicked the horse. And the horse take off. I'm screaming and hollering. I'm screaming. And so my dad come running, my dad come running out the house. He said, what's the matter with her? What's the matter with her? She said, nothing, I made the horse run. He said, oh, shut up. You're going to give me a heart attack. <laughs> he said, oh, something had happened. So that was the story about the horse. Okay, you can go back to Ben Harbor then. So Ben Harbor was the fruit. I told y'all that I finished high school in Ben Harbor. And, uh, did I go over there? Mm -mm, no, we got to six. Okay, so I picked all the fruit in Ben Harbor and I grew up in Ben Harbor. That was a, a Ben Harbor was okay going to the farm. We had, that's what we had fun at. We had our own money because by that time it was money being paid. But one more story in Mississippi, how, how Mississippi was as a kid. And I can remember these things. My oldest brother was cutting timber. And it was, every, the men was all cutting timber. So I don't know who worked, but somehow they got my oldest brother to work in, and he was cutting timber. At the end of the day, they was paying $3 a day. And so when my they finished, my oldest brother went to home and he was excited because he had uh, $2.50 or whatever the change was he had and he put it on the table and he went to take his bath. And when he came back, my grandmother said, uh, this your money? He said, yeah. She said, what happened to the rest? He said, that's all he gave me. She said, well, how much was he, was he paying the men? He said, $3 a day. She said, did you, did he complain about your work? He said, no, ma'am. 
Oh, so he said you did all right. You don't have to move. Okay. And and he said, yes. Yeah. So he's, she said, okay. So this is all he did. She said, yes. Yeah. She mm -hmm. said, okay, put your clothes on, let's go. So my brother put his clothes on and uh, we went to, uh, he took, my grandmother took him down. When she got into the city, uh, up to the boss's office, she went in and she said, Mr. Guy said, this is my grandson say, did uh, you like his work? He said, oh yes, 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 he worked fine. Said, and you have no complaints. And I said, well, why you paid the man $3 and you only paid him whatever it was. And he said, oh yeah, because he wasn't a man. She said, you told me he did this, he did it. And he, you liked his work, you wasn't dissatisfied. He did him the same work that they did, but you're gonna pay him less than, so you owe him some more money. And so she said, you can take this back and give him his money. And so he gave him his three dollars. So that kind of taught all of us to speak up for yourself. <laughs> and that's what she said. If you don't tell people how you feel, they can't look at you and tell. So you got to tell them what you feel. And if you deserve it, then you ought to get it. And, and you know, she taught us a lot of little things that were well, me, uh, what we could do without being rude to people. Just speak your facts, and that's and that's what I have learned in life. But just speak my facts. Do your work, and you get paid for it. hard work. But it's a day's dollar. You got to do a day's work. Um, your transition from Benton Harbor to Chicago. Okay, so I left Benton Harbor, moved to Chicago, and when I came to Chicago, I was kind of like I didn't even know what I wanted to do. Because back in those days, if you did a certain job, that wasn't a woman's job, that was a man's job, and you can't do this, you can't do that. There was always stipulation put on what you could do. And my mother uh, would have a thing about it. If you haven't did this by a certain such time, my mother was the war horse. She'd look at you and would never smile. I thought the lady was always mad. I didn't know what was wrong with my mother. Everybody said she was sweet to everybody but me. But then I was kind of a rough house anyway, so she you knows she had to keep the rain on me. And so when I got here, I moved with Princess Grandmother, which was my sister, and I stayed with her. And in a year's time, I had a pretty nice job. I went to work for Montgomery Wars, and I worked at Montgomery. My first job was Montgomery Wars, and I went to dental assistant school at Chicago, medical and dental assistant downtown Chicago at that time. And mm, never thought about it. but. I, I was going there and I was paying to go to school. At night. I was working days and going to school at night. And I was there and this young lady came in. It was mixed. Uh, a few, I don't know if this, hey, this girl was from Jamaica or someplace. And she came in and said, I'm get, coming up to graduation. And they were supposed to get us a job before we graduated. And so this young lady said, I've been out of work for a month. I graduated and you all haven't found me a job. And she was loud because we in the classroom could hear. She said, you're finding all the white girls jobs, but you haven't found any jobs for us. She said, and I don't think that's right. It's like, even if you didn't find me a job in a white, uh, with a white doctor, you could have got me one with black doctors, plenty of black doctors on the South side. And so she said, so you give me my money back. <laughs> and so I left. Uh, Chicago school. Now that's why grandma told me to take Jesus with me everywhere I go. So I left Montgomery Wards and I went for a better job working for Gold Blacks. And I was I went to work as a file clerk. And when I went in there, I had never seen so much paper in all my life. They had files all around the wall. They couldn't find nobody's file. It was just and I went in and I in a month's time I had they gave me a crew of three people. I had all those people working, filing those files back, and we had put those files back. So the, the, the boss came to me, first of all, let me take it. When I went to the job, I told him I came here. I don't test well, so I'm not taking no tests. I work real good, and I need a job. Now, if you need somebody to work, you tell me, and you give me the job, and I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to do your job. I said, but other than that, I didn't come here for anything but a job. And so he was sitting at the desk looking at me rocking in his back and forth in the chair and he looked up and he said, have a seat. I said, oh, you never did say have a seat, so I didn't sit down. And so <laughs> I sit down. So he said, okay, he asked me my credit. And he said, 
when do you want to start work? I said, Monday. And this is like Tuesday or Wednesday or this week. I want to start Monday next, <laughs> next week. So he said, okay, that's fine with me. So come in and, and you can take the papers home. We can fill them out and come back. So when I started at Goldblast, I did the files and everything. Within a month's time, they moved me to credit cashier, which, oh, I love that. I really love that. I put in the people's checks and validated how much money they paid on their bills, right? And everybody else was doing my files. And I stayed there for about a year. But I had already been to the dental system school. So I had a tooth back. And um, oh, my mouth was killing me. So I went to this dentist. And my dentist referred me to another dentist was close to my neighborhood. And when I got there, this and I was telling them how I wanted my mouth fit. And so he said, How how do you know all this? I said, because I uh went to school for it. And he said, where? And when I told him what happened, he said, you know what? Wednesday, they are opening up a class across the street. And I know this man personally. He wrote a note and said, take this note over there and give it to him when you leave here. And I went over there to, it was called PWO then. And that's when they had a manpower program coming out. It was a program that they would hire mothers that was on aid to work. And so they put me in that program to go to dental assistant school. And that's been over 55 years ago. And I just retired when I was 75, <laughs> a few years ago. I worked all of years and I loved every minute of, of my work in dentistry. So that's what I said. Grandma said, take him everywhere you go. And you know, that had to be Jesus. Send me to that man for him to send me to somebody else. That's what, when you know who you know. And I always tell my kids, you have to know, it's better to know somebody and have it up here and can't find nobody. So that was me in the situation. My education coming out of Ben Harvard High School, I was most afraid of most talking. I didn't talk as much as I talk now. I did not talk because when I left Mississippi and came, my language was like taking me from America and putting me in Germany with no interpreter. And I really didn't know how to speak the, the Northern language because I was a Southerner. So if I stand up to read a book, Everybody would laugh at me because the words I would say was totally different from how they would pronounce their words. And so I just froze and sit and wouldn't even, you know, and they kept me back a grade because I wouldn't participate in class. And I hid it from my mother for a whole year. And then when she finally found out that I did not, because she worked, you know, at night. And when she found out that I wasn't, you know, passing the grade, and she came on my case and said, you can stay there till you get 45 if you want. That's, that's how my, my mother talked. My grandmother would love you to it, but my grandmother, my mother would. She said, you stay there till you get 45, but you don't finish school. So take your time and do whatever you want to do. And she keep walking, you know. Like if I got sick, I had the Asiatic flu. And I was upstairs in my room and I was sick. So I thought, sure, I was going to die. I was up there just crying and crying. She hollered up the stairs, said, you can stay up there and die if you want to, but I ain't coming up there to get you. And so that kind of, you know, put you, make you kind of strong sometimes. So she knew how to treat me to make me do what I want. But in Chicago, when I finished the dental assistant, I went to that dental assistant school, got a job working for Herbert Harris. And I worked for him up until he passed two years ago. Yeah. About two you, years ago. How you became a, your, your calling, your ministry calling? Oh, good Lord. You have to go through some hard things. <laughs> I, 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 Miss my marriage life through that, okay? So I, um, I, I got mm, this. Start, she told me my ministry started back in Mississippi. I was a young kid, and I was my mother would make us go to church on Sunday, Sunday school and church, and I hated both of them. So I was one Sunday went in the backyard and I had this stump out there. I would go out there and preach to the chickens and the cats and the dogs and all that. So I was out there one Sunday and I was saying, Lord. My mom, I knew my mother could hear me. I said, Lord, when I get grown, I'm not going to nobody's church. And I'm definitely not going to nobody's Sunday school. I'm not going to sing in no choir. Oh, I'm just talking to the Lord. <laughs> my mother said, get down and shut up. <laughs> you don't know what you're going to do. I said, she said, you know where you've been, but you don't know where you're going. So shut your mouth and come on in this house. And so. Next Sunday, I come home from church. I go in the yard. I get the butt, a tub of water, and I'm a baptized dog, right? 
I baptized the dog. And my mother came and that she asked my brother, said, where's the dog? I don't see the dog. He said, the dog left him running yesterday because Lily is baptized in the backyard. And I would have church with the kids, like when they go, I'd have everybody singing and dancing and I would just have, and I didn't know that was, you know, so when I, I, I got married, oh my God, when I got married, I had two boys and my first marriage, turn it on. My first marriage, you know, it dissolved in a divorce and I had two boys to raise. So I learned how to talk to God and I told him I didn't know what my calling was and I didn't. So I went to school and I became a Sunday school teacher and wasn't gonna never preach. I told Lord I wasn't gonna do that, right? And I went to, back to school and he had told, told me my calling was to be an evangelist, to be evangelized. And so that's what I did. And I got went to school and got my paperwork for to do that. And I guess I was kind of good at it. Hey, pal. And uh, that was where I came and I prayed inside the womb for to each child a different way. And they both became ministers. And I had no idea I would end up with evangelist. And before they father left here, he was a preacher. And so that was my ministry part. I was in my church. I was telling Princess that I, on one hand, you can count in 40 some years, 42 years, I believe I was in this church. And on one hand, you can count the days I missed. I don't, I like church. And my husband always say, uh, how was church? I said, it was good. He says, is it ever bad? No, it's never bad because I'm church. And that's how I believe. I believe I'm the church and I'm good. So church is good to me. But the evangelist has really taken me far and wide. I've been from Washington to Florida uh, in, with being in this evangelist. I joined the National Baptist Convention. Y'all probably can't see I belong to the National Women of Achievement. I'm not uh, patting myself on the back, but faith without work is dead. And I believe that you have to work at it in order for it to work for you. And that's what I've been doing. I've been working for my uh, faith. And, and they asked me, what, what uh, uh, denomination are you? And I said, Christ like. Uh, names don't mean that much to me. Now, I, I have nothing against nobody else's, but as far as minds go, I believe in the Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. And like I said, my mama gave him to me, so I, I give him to you, but I sure ain't getting rid of it. Okay, he's been too good for me. Been too good to me and to my family. And I, I believe that what, what Peter said in the Bible when they told him to go in the room and pray for the young lady that was dead, he closed the door and said, let me in here by myself because I don't, I don't need nobody in the pen with this. So that's how I feel about uh, the faith in God. Your faith in God is how strong it is to you that you can get through whatever it is you're going through. Uh, I, I, I used to tell my kids, if somebody take a gun and put it in my head, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't believe it'll shoot me. I'm just that show sure about what Jesus will do. He'll turn it around. What else you want me to talk about? Okay, well, I guess she told us her story. <laughs> so, and I appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions before I ask her some questions? Lily, what we had talked about earlier. So did you, so how would you, how was your childhood? Did you have a lot of fun? Did you experience any racism growing up or anything like that? And no, no, I did not. The first I knew about racism was when Emmett Till died in Mississippi. And I think I left that same year when Emma Till died. And I didn't know about the killing. Uh, you know, I, I probably, they probably was talking about it, but it wasn't in the area. If it was, I didn't know about it, okay? Uh, I, 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 this is the truth. My, like I said, my auntie owned her own cafe. My grandmother, I know she worked on the farm, but my mother was a secretary for everybody around in the area where we was. My father had the, equipment to do everybody's land and to bring all the food in to everybody. And so his day was most of it. He weighed all the cotton for everybody. We would be out sometimes till like down there at nine o'clock, it was still light outside. So we had transportation to go to the different ones and weigh the cotton or 
they would put it at a certain place and certain days daddy would go there and, and weigh that cotton and everything so he could take it to the gym or they would send a truck or something to get the people cotton. So I never had that problem. We had food. Oh, Lord. We would have, he had a house, uh, a cotton house. That's what it was called. You put the cotton in during the cotton season. And then when the wintertime come, you would put the corn and the potatoes. And I've had, <laughs> uh, some of you probably won't laugh at you, but to get the corn, how you all are eating corn meal now, we used to have to take it off of the car. So I know how to take a washboard and take the corn, the kernels off of the car into a tub. And then daddy would take it to town and have it ground into meal and bring it back in sacks. And and the beans, I know I, I taught my grandmother, well, they, taught, they wouldn't do it, but I've taught them, uh, Princess will tell you, I buy beans every year just to peel them, uh, 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 do that. I know how to shuck corn, take it all off of there, and then take it off the cob to fry it. I know how to do all of that because that's what we, we had it to do. Now, there were people that didn't have food, but if my daddy found out about it, then we would take food. You know, he, my sister and I, was, I got a, two older sisters, three really, but the oldest one she was married and had. Princess grandmother, I don't remember living with because she's 10 years older than I am. So by the time, what, I was five, she was 15 already. And I think she got married at 15 years old. You like to garden? Sometimes. Love it. Love it. I had a garden uh, this past uh, year. Last year I had a garden. Cucumbers, okra, squash, tomatoes. I grew all of it. In fact, everybody in the neighborhood can tell you that. Go down to Miss Smith's house. She got cucumbers and squash. Yeah, I love the garden. Um, do you ever go back? To I don't think Pace is this. Does Pace still exist now? Uh, I went back to Pace. The last time I was in Pace, I went to the place where I was born. It's that little cafe with that same. And then, listen, they didn't call it a uh, restaurant. They call it a cafe. And the jukebox is still there where you put the nickel in it and play the uh the music does yeah. chicago feel most like home or Benton harbor chicago chicago because that's where i spent my adult life at in chicago okay. with my kids and my husband and my house and all of that yeah okay and my jobs was here so I, I got one more question to ask you so did um so you did say that down there during that time it was a color preference like if you were light you got treated better and all that kind of stuff or or no let me tell this story. Mm -hmm. I said I didn't know prejudice. I didn't at that time know what it was. My god sister was a school teacher. And during the summer months, when everybody was picking and working in the cotton fields, because I was smaller, I lived with my godmother. And she had her own grocery store, candy store, whatever. And we fished and went to the store and whatever. But I went to school with my god sister. And my guys, this particular day, uh, I'm, I, I don't know if I was the smallest or not, but you'd have to raise your hand to go to the bathroom. And that was outside. And so across the street in the front of the schoolhouse was this white lady's house. And we would always raise that way better when we walked to the school. So I went over to the bathroom and I never thought of this story until I saw that story with Miss Jane Pittman in it. I don't remember what the name of the story was. But when she went to the water fountain to lean over to drink the water and all the white people in the town was after her about it. I, maybe you all hadn't seen the picture. But anyway, I went to the bathroom and over there, she had a nice catalog. <laughs> and I'm looking at the catalog in the bathroom. I see this lady running to the one of people out running back. She would come to the one of people out and run back. And I'm saying to myself, I'm like five or six years old. Yeah, it couldn't have been no more. Seven at the most, not, not that old. And I'm saying, what's wrong with her? So I get through, I put the book down, I come on out, go across the street. She passed me running. To the, and when I got up in the door, she in there talking to my gossip. And my gossip come and she she take me and pat me on the arm, you know, holding me. Sad. And I know the exact word. She, she a baby. She didn't know any better. And I promise you that won't happen again. I'm so sorry that happened to you. It will not happen again. And the lady just cried. I started to cry. I'm thinking, you know, I'm a kid. She crying and I'm crying. She crying, but I didn't know what she was crying about. So when 
she left. My god sister told the oldest, because they always sent a, a student aide, they call here, but they sent an older girl. And so my god sister told us that whenever the little ones have to go, you go with them. You take them so they don't go across the street to her house. I never remembered that story till I saw the one where that lady went to that water fountain to get that water. And they told her she wasn't supposed to drink out of that fountain. And that have not been too long, like two or three years old, maybe, whatever, years ago. And that's when I thought, now that was my first prejudice, but I didn't know that that's what it was called. That's the only incident that I remember having. I don't remember having no other with no, uh, you know, they talked to us, we talked to them, you know, they little kids played in our yard, we played in their yard, and that was simple. Tanya, what um, part of Mississippi is your grandfather from? Which grandfather? I don't know. Was my grandfather from Shannon, Mississippi? Oh, was her grandfather from Mississippi? Shannon Ashley. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. By all means. He's from... I'm not sure, Shannon, if he's from Pace, Mississippi, but he's in that area, okay? Because my mother was born in Shelby, Mississippi. So I'm not sure. And that's why I got to find some history on him. Uh, that's a whole new family. I don't know. Okay. All right. Do we, um, do we have any more questions? No? Okay. Well, Who's then... Maxwell, oh, this is Katie Maxwell. Right? Okay. She would, yeah. So I would like to thank everyone in for coming tonight. I'm glad that I had my family sign on. Got some people from Texas. Thank you, Shannon. Appreciate you. Of course, Faith and Place staff. Appreciate you. Elena, thank you for working with me to get me online. Katie, a pleasure. Angie, love you. Thank you, everyone. Orlando, thank you. Love you guys. Thank you for having me, Faith and Place.